Okay, we're moving on to being able to compare not just one proportion against what someone says is true, or not just two proportions against each other. We're actually going to be able to compare multiple proportions all at the same time with this thing called a chi-squared distribution. All right, like I said, this is true. This is what uh, the Wrigley Corporation claims, that when they create Skittles, 30% of them are purple, 20% of them are red, green, and yellow, and 10% of them are orange. You think they're lying. You think they're not telling you the truth based on the Skittles you eat. That's not true. Okay, how can we go about proving them wrong? Uh, yeah, Skittles. Uh, used to be the AP test, and when you guys graduated, it was like pretty far apart, like over a month, years ago. So we used to do a project at the end of the year, and you would go out and get data and do your own hypothesis test. There was a hundred projects I read, like 87 of them dealt with Skittles. That was the most popular one. Everybody wanted to go get Skittles and compare to see if their uh, company was telling the truth or not. Getting a random sample of Skittles was the hard part. I mean, I, I made them, they had to go into Costco and like flip a coin and do all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> I'm thrilled we don't have to do Skittle experiments anymore. But anyway, a lot of people, a lot of your founding fathers have done this analysis to see if they were telling the truth or not. But ultimately, okay, I'm going to go take a random sample of Skittles to see if I can prove the Wrigley Corporation wrong or not. Now, one of the first things we're always going to do is anytime we get data, let's draw a picture of it. Okay, and see what that picture looks like. See if our picture says that there's differences or not. Now, I saw some out there I did not like. Okay, I saw some people out there draw two different graphs. One with what they say is true and one with what we got. I don't want to be looking back and forth and seeing if things are the same or not. I did see a lot of mark chart representations on the same graph, which I like, okay? This would be the percentages, what, 10, 20, it goes up to 30%. Uh, we'll take a look at purple, so here's purple. What they said was true is supposed to be 30% purple. Well, what did we get? So what's the first thing that you had to do over here to make a uh, comparison of the percentages and calculators? So what did we get here for purple? 27 point. Four. Let's just go one decimal place for this kind of stuff. We're going to use it. Oh, man, I forgot. All right, this is for next period. Gosh, darn. I'll add them all on there. That'll be fun. All right. Uh, what'd you get for red? 21.4. Okay, green? Yellow? 23.6. 23.6. That is quite a bit different, isn't it, than what they said was true? Now, this is just from a sample. Is this big enough? Is that big enough difference? Look, if I flip a coin, I might get 51 heads out of 100. That's no big deal. But if I get really far away from 50, then that might be a big deal. There might be something wrong with the coin. And what was the last one here? 8.7%. So let's draw a graph of that. So it was supposed to be 30. We got 27.4. I wish I had a purple pen. That would be really good if I had a purple pen. All right. Then the next one uh, was red. I'm supposed to get 20 from our sample. Oh, I actually have a red pen. This is good. Uh, 21.4. And so on. You drew all the pictures of all of them. And what we're really analyzing is this. This is what I want to know. <coughs> Okay, now if I draw my graph and I see some really big differences here, I might be able to prove Wrigley wrong. Okay, now, if, if I go draw my graphs and every one of these percentages is exactly what they said, I'm probably not going to be able to prove them wrong. So drawing a picture is a good idea um, on these problems first. There's also this kind of picture for this. So I haven't spent a lot of time on this. Turn to 730, please. Another way to draw the same thing, that's called a segmented bar graph. So I guess you're comparing the colors, right? I don't like that graph. For some reason, that, that graph's not as obvious to me as to which is different. So I remember it was about five or six years ago. Uh, we're going through our final review, and like the day before the test, the class asked, hey, what's this segmented bar graph? Do I have to know that? I said, no, don't worry about it. I don't like it. 
What do you think happened the very next day? It was on the test. It was the first problem on the test. It was a segment. Of, they came back. They were cussing at me. <laughs> so I guess we got to know this thing. So understand what it means. I like this better. It may make you draw something like this. So just be aware. Okay. All right. So how do we go through this process? Now, bottom line, here's what we're trying to trying to figure out: Is what we got that much different, significantly different from what we were expecting in order for us to call the company a liar based on our sample. So we're going to compare what we got versus what we were expecting. All right, I need everybody to draw a box in here. We're going to do this comparison in the box and actually break it into five different categories. All right, we had purple, we had red, Green, yellow, and orange. And then in the lower part of the box, I want you to put parentheses. I'll explain that in a minute. This will go in the calculations part of the hypothesis test, but this is how we're actually going to do this comparison between what they said was true and what we got. All right, now, I think, James, you were kind of building a chi squared thing there. I, I, have you done this before or something? Okay, now it's, now here's, here's what James was doing. He was putting these percentages in there. We don't compare the percentages in a chi squared test. We compare the actual counts, what we got versus what we were expecting. And that's going to be a very common mistake a lot of you make. You're going to be putting like the point threes and point two seven. No, we don't do that. You put the actual counts in here. We got 192 purple ones, and we got 150 red ones, and 132 green ones. We got, what was that, 165? Yeah. Before I changed it? No, 160. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was 165. And this was 61 for a total of 700. Okay, so please don't ever put percentages in that box. Now what we're going to put in here in these parentheses were, okay, if Wrigley's is telling the truth and I looked at 700 Skittles, how many would I expect to be in here? How'd you get that? You said 210. What'd you do? 30, the percentage, times N, the, the, how many we had, N times P, is this ringing a bell, right? We did that with percentages. N times P doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> See what I deal with every day? N times P, yeah. That's my, in fact, that's going to be one of our test statistics. The expected value is equal to N times P. Yeah, I, I'm looking at, there's 700 of them I'm looking at. Okay, how many would I expect to be purple? 700 times the 0.3, which ends up being 210. Now, these can be decimals. So you go to one decimal place. This could end up as a decimal. So go to one decimal place. And I actually want you to show that in here. Um, so you've got the test statistic here. So just show how you got that. 700 times 0.3. All right, let's go figure out the rest of them. This would be 40.0. 40.0, 40.0, and this would be 70.0, right? 700 times 10%. We expect 10% of them to be orange. Go ahead and put those numbers in L1 and L2. trick here, like I said, the expectants won't always be even numbers. So if you want your calculator to be able to keep all the digits, um, you can do, uh, right here you could do 700 times 0.3. I know that doesn't have a decimal right now, but if it did, it would keep all those decimals in there for you. Okay. Alright, so we have 140, 140, 
seven. All right, so here's what I got. That's what I was supposed to get. Is that far enough away? I'm supposed to, if I flip a coin 100 times, I'm supposed to get 50 heads. Okay, well, if I get 51, is that a big deal? Not so much. If I got 90, would that be a big deal? Yeah. So that's what we're trying to figure out. Is this, this is too much beyond the element of chance, or is that within the element of chance? So I want to figure out how different these are. What do you want to do? How can I figure out how different these guys are? Subtract them. See how different they are. So let's do that. Let's subtract them. So go over to L3. We'll take uh, what we got, L1 minus L2. And that's how different they are. So if I'm trying to figure out typically how different they are, what would we do with these numbers? Find the, not how different apart they are, how different, how big these numbers are. Typically how big is this? What would I find? Find the mean. Go find the mean of those numbers. Let's find out on average how far apart they are. I mean, let's figure out on average how how much away from what I expected are, are we getting. What you guys get? Zero. zero. Why? Why are we getting zero? Those numbers aren't. Why, why, why am I getting an average of zero? They, they add up to. What do those numbers add up to? Zero. They add up to zero. We've seen this before. Where did we see this before? Residuals? No. Uh, yes, we did. We saw it in residuals. That's right. But even before residuals, where do we see it? What? I heard it. Standard deviation. Remember in standard deviation, all the deviations added up to zero? So what did we have to do with those numbers so that the deviations wouldn't add up to zero? We squared them. Chi squared. Now you're seeing why we're doing the chi squared thing. Okay, so that is the next thing that we're going to do. We're going to square all those. So take those numbers and square them. Scott, pay attention. Do what I'm doing. So take all the numbers in L3 and square them. And now I've got these differences squared. All right, well, we have another issue here. Um, I took a sample size of 700. And these are the differences I got and the squared differences I get if I took a sample size of 700. Well, what if I had taken a sample size of 7 million? These numbers would be in hundreds of thousands, right? So wouldn't those differences be bigger just because I took a bigger sample size? So I want to take that out of consideration. I want to see relatively, in a standard basis, I want to find out relatively how different they are without having how big of a sample size have such a big deal of it. So here's what they do. We divide by these numbers. So if these numbers were in millions, if we're dividing by millions, it's all going to come down to the same standardized score. If these numbers were in tens, then we just divide by that number. Okay. That leads us to our formula. This is the chi-squared formula. It's on page five. Go find it. It's below those boxes. It's kind of hidden. It's not one you have to memorize, but it is on page five. You still have people writing formulas down wrong on tests when they're in your book, in your notes. Okay? Chi squared is just what we just did. Hey, how different are these guys? Oh, I can't find the average difference, so I better square it. Okay, then I'm going to divide by this number so that it takes how big of a sample I took out of consideration. So let's go, let's go do that. And you don't have to do this L3 and L4. We can do it all at one time. So let's do that. All right, so highlighting the top, and I'm going to do that chi-squared formula. So parentheses, the observed value, those are in L1, minus the expected, so those we put in L2, parentheses squared, 
and then divided by, and it's divided by the expectants, those are in L2. This gives us a standardized look at how different those numbers are. And take a look at this guy. Which color is represented by that biggest chi-squared value? It wasn't yellow the biggest difference? Look at yellow. 25 different. And that shows up in that chi-squared value. That has the biggest relative difference. Okay? So you can kind of determine which one of these guys has the biggest relative difference. In this case, it's that particular color. All right, here's the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to add them all up. All right, so let's do a one bar stat on L3, add those guys up. Looks like 8.335. So is that, is that a big difference or not? Is, is having that big of a relative difference, 8.335, is that, is that common that I'd get a difference like that? Or are these guys way different than what I expected them to be? We get that from our last graph we're going to look at, page 17. This is called a chi-squared distribution chart. It's not a normal curve anymore. It's right skewed. And it's going to tell us if 8.33 is a big deal or not. Page 17, it's a right skewed graph. We're going to be we're going to be writing it here in our we're going to be drawing a picture of it here in our calculations like we did before. It's right skewed. We got 8.34 actually, if I round it. Page 17, green sheets. Here are your green sheets. You should have it out in front of you. All right, now, here's what the, how we read this graph. 8.33, is that a big deal or not? Well, let's think about this for a second. I added up five different categories, didn't I? What if Skittles had like 500 different colors? So I'd have 500 of these guys, and I was adding up the chi-squared for each of them. Would 8.33 be a whole different number than if I was adding up 500 of them, than if I was just adding up 5 of them? So we need to have a degrees of freedom to figure out how many categories we had. So the degrees of freedom formula for a uh, chi-squared test, now careful, here's another place you're going to screw up. Some of you are going to use the old degrees of freedom formula, n minus 1, and you're going to say degrees of freedom is 699. No. Degrees of freedom has to do with how many categories we're dealing with. So in this case, it's the number of columns, categories, minus 1. That just tells that we know where to look in the chart, how many different things we're adding up. So for this particular problem, degrees of freedom is equal to 5 minus 1, which is 4. Okay, now we're ready to go look at our chart. So we've got four degrees of freedom, and we're looking for a chi-squared of 8.34. Again, it's not going to hit specifically on any one spot. We're going to have to get an interval. What interval do we find for this problem? Between 5 and 10%? So let's take a step back and just see what that means, okay? If they're telling the truth, there's between a 5 and a 10 percent chance of getting something this wacky. That's what, or worse. But there's between a 5 and a 10 percent chance that I would get a sample like I got. We're going to compare that to our alpha level. Now, if I'm taking on a corporation, I'm probably going to set my, I better be right. I don't want to call them liars and then have them sue me for all the money I have, right? So I'm probably going to set my alpha level around 1%. I don't want to make a type 1 mistake here. So that's probably not enough evidence for me. Now, it's pretty unlikely that I would get something like this. Pretty unlikely, but maybe not unlikely enough for me to call them liars. Now, but Spencer, I'd set my alpha at 20%. I don't care about calling him a liar. But these guys I'm afraid of. Okay, so we're going to compare our p-value to our alpha level and decide whether we can call them liars or not. All right, that's the basic structure. Let's go through this step by step now and see how this is going to look in a full hypothesis step. Formulation parameter. 
All right, there's five different categories I'm looking at here for the one population of Skittles. Okay, I told period three they're going to be mad at me. I told period three they had to write them all out separately. P sub P equals P sub R equals. He had to do it five different times. And then last period I decided I'd change that. Okay, so here's what I'll let you guys do. Uh, we'll do P sub P um, R. R for red, green, yellow, and orange. And then you better really do a good job of explaining it here. The true proportion of colors of Skittles for purple, red, green, yellow, and orange. Okay, what is the true proportion that's, uh, that the Wrigley's Corporation is putting out there for Skittles? And then give me those colors, what those subscripts mean. Okay, so you can write it all on one line. You don't have to do it five separate times. But make sure you do a good job of writing it up. Do you have to put like in run bag or? No, no, it's the total Skittles they put out there in the market. Okay. This is this is how they do it. Now, obviously, different bags can have different makeups just because that's the, the sample that they took. But we're talking about overall, the true proportion overall for. All right, our null hypothesis. We're going to assume that the Rigby Corporation is telling the truth. How would we write that? Well, P sub P is supposed to be 30%. Uh, you could write that as 0.3. Or you could write that as 30%. If you like writing percentages, that's fine. Uh, P sub R is 20%. P sub green is 20%. P sub yellow is 20%. And P sub orange is 10%. I guess you could get fancy here in the middle if you wanted to. You could say P sub R equals P sub G equals P sub Y equals 20%. I guess we want to save a little bit of time. But we're supposed to, you're supposed to itemize and say what each one of the probabilities is supposed to be. Okay, this one's tricky. The alternate's tricky here. We're looking at 8.33. So we're looking at all of those proportions, all those chi squares at the same time. And we're trying to see if all of them lead to a chi-squared greater than what we would have expected. All right, so ultimately what we're going to be able to prove here, let's say our p-value would have been lower than the alpha level. I don't know that all of them are wrong. I know at least one of them is not what they say it's supposed to be. And that's what we're going to say here. That's what we're able to prove. At least, these are key words here for this alternate hypothesis, at least one of the above are incorrect. I mean, when we went and looked at those individual chi squares, we, we definitely thought the yellow might be a culprit here. Okay, but we're not sure about which one. That's all we're going to be able to prove. Hey, I don't know which one's wrong. At least one of them. Wrigley, you're lying if we're able to go there. Level of significance, I'm taking on a corporation here. I don't want to make a type 1 error. I'm going 1%. I'm going to be darn sure if I'm going to publicly call that corporation a liar. Okay, our assumptions are a little different here for a chi-squared test. Now, there's a relationship. What was our big assumption? NP, N1 minus P greater than 10. It's, it's similar, okay, but it's a little bit different how we do it. Uh, the first one, we want to make sure we got a good simple random sample of Skittles. That was always the hardest thing for the students that were doing their experiments on Skittles. As hard as they try, they were not getting a good simple random sample of Skittles, but let's see what they do here. All right, now remember there we had NP, N1 minus P greater than 10. Well, we're still going to look at these expected values. That's where we're going to look. We're going to look at these guys. And there's two things that have to be, uh, have to be true. Number one, all the expected values must be greater than or equal to 1. All of the expected values, 100% of the expected values have got to be greater than or equal to 1. Are all of these expected values at least 1? You know, they're way more than 1, right? Somebody last period said, well, how can you ever have an expected value less than 1? And I said, well, wait a minute, what, what if, 
what if like finding an orange one is like finding a prize or something? So they, this is the probability that Wrigley does for orange. If I multiply that times n, right, I'm going to get less than 1. So it's, it's possible, okay? Basically what this assumption is trying to do is, hey, did you take a big enough sample size and are these probabilities reasonable? Alright, so here's how we write this up. You've got to check it out to make sure it's 100%. So you count them, yep, all five of them. So you'll say five out of five, which is equal to 100% check. Yes, all of the expected values are greater than one. We're going to do the math there, check them all out. All right, the next assumption, the last one. At least 80% of the expected values must be greater than or equal to 5. Remember, n, p, n, 1 minus p greater than 5. Some books say that. That's kind of what's going on here. So not only do all of these expected values have to be greater than 1, but at least 80% of them have got to be greater than 5. How are we doing on this one? Are they all greater than 5? So, so we're fine here. Here we still have 5 over 5, which is 100%, which is greater than 80%. Yeah. Like, let's say one of these expected values was 3, right? Then 4 out of the 5 would be greater than, than 5. So we'd have 4 out of 5, which is 80%, which is at least 80%, so that would be okay. If we had two of them that were 3, that ain't going to work. Yeah? Um, so like on last time, on the last chapter, if, say, 3 was wrong, we would say we would call into question the normality. What now, we're not, now we're calling into question chi squared, but here's what you'll do. Don't worry about this right now, but he asked the question, so I'll answer it. So let's say we had two of these categories, and they both had three in it. And only so now only three of the five, 60%. What would we do? We would combine these two into one category. So now the expected value for that one would be six, and it would be met. So that's how we can get around it in chi-squared. We actually collapse categories. We'd only have four now. We can go forward like that. So it is a deal breaker, but there's ways we can get around it. All right, so we're good with the assumptions. Our test statistics, okay, we got two of them. This is the other one. I'll let you abbreviate a little bit here. So chi-squared is equal to summation O for observed. O minus E squared over E. I'll let you write it like that. We have three different test statistics we're using for the chi-squared test. All right, what you're going to show in calculations is your box. You're going to show how you got one of the expected values. You're going to draw your picture. Now, the only other thing you've got to do is show me how this formula works. Now, you do all the math in your calculator. That's not a problem. But you've got to show me what your calculator's doing. You've got five categories here. Remember that problem we did before? We had to show me two of them and then dot, 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 and the last one. That's what we're going to do here as well. All right, so where's my room here? So chi squared is equal to, and you show me how this formula works. So in the first one would be the observed, which is 192 minus 210 squared over 210. That's the first one. Plus, that's the summation, uh, 150 minus 140 squared over 140 plus dot, dot, dot. And then show me the last one, 61 minus 70 squared over 70. And that equals, throw that in your calculator, there's your 8.34 that we got from our calculator. Then you draw your picture. Um, notice, you're doing this work, but you're using it back here in the assumptions. You're actually going to go to your calculations, do your box, and then use information from your box in your assumptions. It's just kind of out of order there. Finally, our conclusion, it's the same three-paragraph conclusion. And what would this one look like? Hey, assuming Wrigley's telling the truth, and the probability for, for purple is 30, and red, green, and yellow is 20%, and orange is 10%, the chances of getting a distribution like the one I got is between 5 and 10%. First sentence, tell me about P-value. What's it Hey, assuming they're telling the truth, chances of getting my distribution, between 5 and 10%. Or P, but now, now, you guys are killing me right now. I have some students, and I think in this room, that still don't know how to compare p-value and the alpha level yet. That, that, we're beyond that. 
second sentence, since our p-value is greater than our alpha, we will not reject. Now, okay, let's clean this up right now, because some of you lost points on your test last night. If I, so you had this on your test, right? We couldn't reject. I mean, we could reject. I'm trying to steer you wrong. We could reject. We couldn't reject, right? P-value was too big. Now, here, and this is what we should say, right? We don't have statistically significant evidence to say this. I have some of you saying, okay, we proved this is right. No, we didn't prove this is right. So get that last sentence right. In this case, we would say we do not have statistically significant evidence to say at least one of the proportions is not what they say it is. Okay. Or we do not have statistically significant evidence to say at least one of the percentages is against what Ridley, what Ridley says. Okay, so you still have your three sentence conclusion. Questions, comments? Areas of confusion, people want to put the percentages in here, don't. Okay, these need to be the counts. Okay, that's a big area of problems. Oh, another one, people want to do the 700 minus 1 here, right? No, it's not the sample size you got, it's the number of categories we're looking at. Those are two big areas that people miss. Questions, comments?